So welcome to the third day of this uh, workshop. Welcome to the third day in Flatlands. My first speaker is Fakha Hassalt, giving us a talk about well, Dirac systems and numerical simulations. Please. Well, thank you very much, Holger. Um, good, so I also thank the organizers for the opportunity to talk here. And um, so, um, so we do numerical simulations, et cetera. And, and uh, um, goal is to, you know, come up with uh, nice toy models where maybe the physics is interesting, the emerging physics is interesting, and also um, to look into possibly realistic uh, simulations of re realistic models and directly compare it to, um, to experiments, right? So this is, the, this is the, you know, the aim of the type of numerics we do. And so here's the outline. Um, I'll start by reviewing very quickly the, the fermion Monte Carlo, especially um, the differences between the HMC approach and the BSS, because with the HMC in some parameter regions, you can go to um, extremely large system sizes. And then I'll show some, some results, which were, which were taken by, which were measured by Maxime on um, the Fermi velocity renormalization. And that's, these are remarkable results in the sense that they can, uh, you can go to really big lattices. So 100 times 100 would be the, the sort of starting point, hopefully. And you can really do simulations and compare directly the simulations to, uh, to experiments, especially on the Fermi velocity renormalization in freestanding graphene. And so that will be then the end of realistic stuff. And then we'll move on to, uh, to toy models till, you know, till, till the chairman stops me. Uh, talk a bit about spermion superconductivity, which arises if you have the possibility of dynamically generating a quantum spin hole insulator, then um, the spermion excitations of this quantum spin hole insulator carry charge 2E, and you can make them condense, thereby you know, getting a direct transition from a quantum spin hole insulator to an S wave uh, superconductor. Um, so this is also has instances of deconfined quantum criticality. You know, the, the quantum spin all to superconductor transition you know, at half filling is a deconfined quantum critical point. And um, it can, I mean, there's, a, there's an idea that it could be related um, to um, a nonlinear sigma model, an SO5 nonlinear sigma model um, with a Vesumino Witten term. And in the last part, if I have time, I will show you some, some, um, some calculations where, where we were able to really simulate, um, a, it's a basically a Landau level type regularization of this continuum model. And so you can, be, you can really simulate the model at the SO5 symmetric point and ask yourself the question if this model sustains a, a, a CFT. So that will be, I hope I'll have time to get there and then I'll conclude. But, but before starting, many thanks to, to the people who work with me in Würzburg um, um, uh, on numerics. So uh, you know, we all do some types of numerics in different, different domains. Um, a lot of the work which I will present was done by Senju Wang, who was a PhD in Würzburg and who is now a postdoc at the Max Planck in, uh, in Dresden. Toshio Sato also is working uh, in this collaboration. Jonas is working also on Dirac systems. Francesco is working on Dirac systems. And Maxime, I'll show you his results for our large scale simulations. Good. So um, let me start with the fermion QMC. And um, so, you know. Quantum Monte Carlo is, is good for thermodynamics, for equilibrium thermodynamics. And the, the basic object we will, we will look at as a partition function and we write it in the auxiliary field approach. We write it as a, you know, a functional integral over let's say a scalar field, which is space and time dependent and an action. Um, importantly, the action is, the, is an action of a one body problem in an external space and time dependent Field. So for a, for, a given, for a given field phi, you can calculate the principle of this action in uh, polynomial time. And then, um, so the, the Monte Carlo part, of course, comes into account by carrying out the functional integral with, with, stochastic, with stochastic methods. So how do, we, how do you formulate this? And let's start with a, a problem where you have, um, let's say, um, that would be tight binding on, on honeycomb lattice, for example, so discretization of Dirac's. And a long range Coulomb repulsion, so like VIJ. And um, we can actually um, carry out a Herbert Sotonovich transformation to, to decouple this interaction term. So that will give me my scalar field phi, which is space and time dependent. And this uh, scalar field will um, couple to the density, to the fluctuations of the density away from unity. Now, this formulation is, is, a, is a 
rather old now for, for long range Coulomb repulsions. And it only works if um, V is positive definite, otherwise, they, you know, otherwise the, the Gaussian integration uh, uh, diverges, it won't converge. Um, for the half filled case, for graphene at half filling, you can carry out a particle hole, a partial particle hole transformation, right? So transform the spin up into um, holes, right, if you want. And um, the, so the electron will spin up into holes, and then you can use time reversal symmetry to show actually that um, the, the, um, the, the action is real, or essentially that the determinant to the squared is, a, is the determinant is positive, essentially. So it's real and determinant to the squared is positive, meaning that the, the, the eigenvalues, uh, eigenvalues comes in complex conjugate pairs. So this is, this is actually pretty standard right now. And, um, and the question is, how, do we, how will we do the sampling, right? And there are two uh, methods which are, which, are, which are different and which have different scaling and which are you know, used in different communities. I mean, in the, in the solid state community, we normally um, keep the fermion determinant. So we work directly with the fermion determinant. Of course, if you work with a determinant and you want to upgrade a field, then the computational time will scale as the volume. So volume is the linear length to the power d to the cubed times the imaginary time L tau, right? So this is a, a slow algorithm. Um, it's memory intensive, but it's very flexible and it's rather robust because essentially when you, you can get away with very often with discrete variables, uh, you can do single spin flip updates um, and you, you don't suffer too much from the problems you encounter when you, um, uh, from zeros of the determinant, essentially, right? So this is a, it's a, it's a rather, it's a slow, and flexible and robust algorithm and it's also memory intensive. This is sometimes also a problem. On the other hand, if you um, want to speed up on this then the, the only way somehow is to get rid of the determinant and that's what is done in the, um, more in the, the high energy community Namely, the determinant to the squared can be written like this, and then you can throw in some new variables, eta, so these are pseudo fermions, and then you call pseudo fermions to evaluate if you want stochastically uh, the determinant. So this, this algorithm is, is um, you know, hard to implement, um, not technically hard to implement, but it's hard to make it work um, because um, it can go um, rather unstable if M is not well conditioned. You can have problems with ergodicity, ergodicity et cetera. Now, so, so the, the quality of the algorithm, what I'm trying to say is that the quality, the, the way the algorithm performs is really very model dependent. And um, for graphene, for freestanding graphene with the CRPA type um, uh, with Coulomb repulsions, then it turns out that's a result that comes from Maxime's work. Basically, it turns out that it scales very well. The volume times the imaginary time to the power of 1.5. So this is for a special model, right? So this is what we will use for the um, for for our work on graphene. If you try to use this approach close to the Gauss-Neuburg critical point, right, then you have a lot of problems with the zeros of the determinant. And essentially, the bottom line is that these two algorithms are very comparable. Although nominally the HMC should be quicker, it turns out that they are more or less equivalent. The sizes we can do are very similar. Right? You cannot do at the cost number point, you know, simulations on 100, 100, or 200 by 200 um, lattice sites. That, that won't work. Okay, so before going on, let me tell you that at least for the VSS, we are, we are developing a, a packet now for, for some time, for a couple of years. Um, it's, um, it's, um, it, it's actually pretty fun to do. Uh, it's, um, the question is, what is the most general Hamiltonian you can write down so that you can, um, you know, sort of simulate all your, all your favorite models in the solid state. Um, so I won't go through this, it would take too much time, but essentially we have a, a, um, a kinetic energy, we have interactions which can be um, written down as sums of perfect squares. I mean, obviously a perfect square is something which you can very easily decouple with a harvest autonovich transformation. So that's why we write this down. And, um, and then we have another term, which is a scalar. Um, this Ising variable that can be a, a, a scalar variable or an Ising variable which couples to a one body a term and then there's a dynamic of this uh, scalar variable. So this couples, you know, all the, all the simulations I'll present today can be done with this, with this algorithm. You know, and if you want to download it, try it out, do it, contact us if you have issues, et cetera, et cetera.
So now let me start. Um, and uh, again, the idea here for the first part is to um, is to really um, you know directly compare experiments with uh, with theory. And again, this this is the, the results uh, I will show or present or, or summarized in, in this paper. Here. So to set the stage, um, graphene, um, freestanding graphene has low density of states at the Fermi energy. The Coulomb repulsion is not screened and thereby the Fermi liquid becomes unstable essentially. And this shows up in um, logarithmic divergence of the velocity. So these are experiments and it's well, it's documented, put it that way. Now, um, if we want to compare this with, um, with, with real with calculations, so lattice calculations, then we need a model and the model we take are essentially tight binding electrons on the honeycomb lattice with a hopping of, I think, 2.7 electron volts. And then comes the questions of what should we choose for the repulsion? Now, of course, um, at long distances, you will have the Coulomb repulsion in vacuum, right? But at short distances, you have higher energy bands, which will screen uh, the Coulomb repulsion. And this is something which has been worked on in this paper in the framework of the constrained RPA, where you really try to um, take into account the higher energy bands, which are not contained in your model description, by, uh, they will screen essentially the, um, the Coulomb repulsion. And so these are the, these are the numbers which comes from, from this paper for the, for the Hubbard U, for the nearest neighbor uh, repulsion, next, next nearest neighbor, et cetera. I can't see my eyes are not so good anyway. But this, these are this, we, we basically take this line for the, for, the, for the short range interactions and then um, basically then fit, um, you know, add a tail, interpolate this last number to a tail, which, you know, goes to the Coulomb repulsion in a um, in vacuum. So this is for the model. These are the experiments. And there's still one problem is how do we compare? The, the experiments, essentially, they, they, um, they, they have finite doping, right? So they dope, and then they measure the Fermi velocity at a finite doping. Uh, the numerical simulations are carried out at half filling. Uh, you get the dispersion relation. The dispersion relation, the single particle dispersion relation is obtained from using a max end method. And then you can fit, if you want, the, the, the dispersion relation. Um, and, and, and essentially do a rigid band shift to match, if you want, the doping, which corresponds to the exper experimental um, situation. So that's the way, that's the way, we, that's the way we do it. So here's the, you know, just a glimpse of the results and you should go to Maxime's talk this afternoon if you want to hear more. Um, so this is the, the density away from half filling, the doping density, and this is the Fermi velocity renormalization. Uh, this are this is experiment, right? And this is this is um, um, a Monte Carlo data, um, sort of high energy Monte Carlo data on 100, 200, 2 at rather high temperatures. And so th the first thing you should see is that well, I thought it was absolutely remarkable to see that you can't put a line between here and here, and that the experiments and the and the um, and the and the numeric stick. So that that's absolutely remarkable. But then we want to go beyond this, you know, this. You know, and uh, well, there is a problem with the experiments. There is also a problem with the, with the Monte Carlo, but with experiment, essentially, um, we, can't, we can't really trust this anymore because um, if you dope your graphene, your freestanding graphene, then your, um, you will essentially um, generate a Fermi surface, you will screen. And so you will obtain, you will get screening essentially, you will get deviation from logarithmic form. So this deviation here is essentially of um, a, a problem of the way you calculate your, or you determine the Fermi velocity here because you, you put in a, a, a essentially screening back again. So the Monte Carlo also has issues. I mean, this, this fits well for high energy. For lower energies, then you see that you have some deviations. Um, these are along two different uh, directions in the Brillouin zone. And so the question is, you know, what are these, what are these differences? Is it a temperature effect or the size effects? Etc. cetera, but um, so this is, I think is where we stand. And um, I, the, this is for one or two, one or two lattices, but uh, Maxime is working on getting things running on a 204, 204, and also at lower, lower temperatures. At 204, lower temperatures, if these are size or temperature effects, we can get rid of them, then we will really get an overlap with the, with the, with the, um, with the uh, experiment. So that would be, rather amazing that would you know, open a lot of possibilities to gauge against other type of you know calculations perturbation theory etc okay so this would be my first the first uh, the, the more experimentally oriented part of the talk 
please please interrupt right if you if i if you don't you don't have to wait till the end to interrupt and just unmute yourself and say something then i don't feel so lonely here in my office uh, okay. <laughs> since, <laughs> since you say it yeah uh, so beta equals 16 one over ev is of the order in kelvin i mean how does it compare to experiments it's that pretty is high the, temperature I'm, I'm, it's pretty high temperature it's more than thousand Kelvin. I oh, yeah, mean, it's pretty high. So, the, it's, it's, so, so uh, oh, yeah, oh yeah, much more. One EV. Um, so no. So one EV is ten thousand Kelvin, right? So it's right. about ten thousand. So eight hundred Kelvin, something like that. Right? So it's still pretty. But high. I mean, the experiments weren't done at that high temperature. No, I guess the temperatures are much. Low, the temperature is low. So so there is. So there are these are there are temperature effects and size effects which have to be checked. Uh huh. Okay. Right? That, that's we're very well aware of. Completely. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So now, um, skirmion superconductivity. So that goes more to the toy model part of the section. And um, the starting point of this is to dynamically generate a quantum spin Hall state. And then why would that be interesting? I'd like to you know, just um, argue um, based on a, on a simple sort of mean field type picture. So this is our, this is our, our, our honey, you know, type binding honeycomb lattice, which gives rise to our DRAX. And this term here, is nothing but it, it's a what you call a k-mediated term. It's a it's a discretization, if you want, of the of a, of a, like the Haldane mass, but for you know with two different sizes in the spin sector. So I think it would be i gamma zero gamma three gamma five, right in the in the in the continuum, something like that. So that would give rise to a quantum spin Hall state. And if you um, if you decide to take this vector n to be uh, n z, so e z, something like this, then this gives you exactly the k-mediated the K-Mele model, right? So this gives you exactly the sigma Z here, and this is the um, K-Mele sort of mass term. So if you diagonalize this, if you take EZ, that's the next slide, if you take EZ is equal to one, and so N of X is just a constant in the Z direction, then you just have the K-Mele model, which is, a, so this is a mass term, you have, a, you have an insulator, and um, if you put it on open boundary conditions, you have then um, your edge states, a helical, a helical edge state. So this is this is um, this is what this will be the starting point, and then you ask yourself the question: Well, if I dynamically generate this quantum spin all insulator, then this vector n will get will get some dynamics. Huh? So it won't be a static; it will it will have time, space, and time fluctuations. And I can ask myself the question: Well, what happens? What happens if I if this n of x describes a skirmion? So I'll put an n of x. Which is which has a, a skirmion texture, right? So the spin would be down here in the center, and then it folds out. You know, somewhere here I would have something like a vortex, and then it goes up at infinity. So we can, you know, we can do the just on a lattice on a, so send you these these calculations on a on a on a thirty two by thirty two lattice. You can just put in your 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 skirmion texture and uh, make sure that the skirmion is small enough to fit on the lattice. And then you calculate again exactly the density of states. And what you find is that you've actually transferred two particles from the upper band to the lower band, which means that the skirmion has a charge and the skirmion has actually a charge too. Right? So a skirmion in a quantum spin all insulator carries a charge which is a 2e. Now, there is, this is, this is um, something which has been shown beautifully in the work of Helen Volver and, and Sentel. And essentially what they did here was to go into a frame, if you want, a rotating frame, sorry, where n of, n of x is rotating to the z, to ez at each point. And because you go into a rotated frame, you get in this rotating frame, you get a, a sort of a time reversal vector potential, which pumps charges, exactly two charges from the lower band to the upper, upper band. So, so if, we're able to, if we're able to generate um, dynamically a, um, a, top, a quantum spinal insulator, we may have some skirmions. If we can get the skirmions to proliferate, then we could destroy the quantum spin hall insulator and lead to a superconductor. And the question is, is that is that feasible at least with a toy model? That's, that's the question we would like to ask. And the answer is yes. And the toy model we came up with was um, it, it, embarrassingly simple. We basically take this Kane-Mille term here, right? We take the Kane-Mille term here and uh, we just square it. So on each hexagon, you have a term like this, and you basically square it. So it's very, it's, if you do a mean field decomposition of this Hamiltonian, then you come very quickly to something, you could come to something which looks like, like this, right? So um, does, this, does this do what we want? 
And to, um, to see this, we calculated um, the, the sort of the quantum spin hall order parameter, right? So that's an SO3 order parameter transformed as a, under SU2 transformation as a vector. Um, and it's time reversal invariant. And it's just sort of, sort of a, yeah, this is just basically this term on each hexagon. And because we are, we will be, okay, so we sort of guess the answer. Uh, the answer will be somehow that we will get some S-wave superconductor. So we will also measure this um, S-wave order parameter, which is a U1 broken symmetry um, state. So these are the two measurements we will do, at least at the beginning. So, so um, Sandro talked about um, those gross mover transitions in his first talk, in the first talk of the, of the workshop. So I won't, I, won't, um, I won't talk too much about this, but basically one very efficient way of, of getting the transition is to compute this. Um, so we have a, an order parameter, the susceptibility of the order parameter, and we can define a, a correlation ratio. Um, and this correlation ratio is a renormalization group invariant quantity, right? So which, uh, if you have no corrections to scaling, it has a crossing at lambda equals lambda C. So these are the results, right? And, um, and here would be then the, as a function of system size, here we would have a semi-metal, here the, the, the lines go up, right? And we would say that we have something like a, a broken symmetry state. So if you read some of Egal's paper, Egal will tell you, well, this should be exactly plus Neville Heisenberg um, with, so what is it? Four, um, four Dirac, um, four two component Dirac fermions, right? Uh, this should be exactly a, a gross neveu transition. Um, and uh, just as, the, as what uh, Sandra was talking about in the Heisenberg, uh, gross neveu Heisenberg Universality class. So, so we, this is a table where, where we sort of um, compare what we get for the exponents. Uh, these are exponents which were presented by Sandro uh, on Monday on his D wave, um, D wave, um, sort of D wave, uh, Hubbard model in a, in a D wave. Uh, this, these are, I think, so I'm, I'm not going to get this correct, I right? think, but they, these are um, HMC calculations from, from Pavel. Uh, these are, I forget, you guys. I think uh, these are our calculations again. These are Sandro's calculations, his famous PRX calculation. And these are Francesco's calculations. These are calculations which comes from Mikhail. These are, et cetera, et cetera. The large end, I think Lucas is 49. And I think, uh, I forgot who is 48. I'm sorry. But, you know, given this, so what do we learn from this? We learn from this that uh, given the scatter, right, we're just okay, right? And so it's a maybe a bit depressing conclusion, but uh, that, that's, that, that's, the, that's the thing. There are deviations, but on the whole, I think those, those papers are, are at least from the Monte Carlo point of view, they, are, they, they, go, they start at 2014, I know this, and they go up to uh, this month, right? This was published this month. And so, you know, as a function of time, there seems to be some sort of convergence, right? Here you see there's a big glitz, right? 0 0.5, 0 0.8, there's some sort of convergence. So that's, that's the best we can do with these going on. Good, so now, so we have a quantum spin hall. I don't want to talk too much about exponents, but now the question is, what is the physics, right? What, what are the excitations of this quantum spin hall? And can we see some skirmions? That, that's a, a, so the first thing I'd like to, to, to show is, ask of myself is, do we have preformed pairs? Meaning that if I start to dope the system, right? Will I dope directly with a pair as opposed to an electron? So what this calculates is the, you can just look at the inset here. So we put ourselves nicely in the, in the quantum spin hall phase. And we um, essentially calculate the single particle gap and the pairing gap divided by two. Now you will see that two times the single particle gap minus the pairing gap is bigger than zero. That means that, you know, if I dope the system, I will dope a pair and I will not dope two independent electrons. Meaning that two electrons, basically if I dope them, they bind and they want to form a pair. So pairing goes through, um, doping goes through pairing. Now, we would like to understand if the if the if the pair really corresponds to a skirmia. Right? And so the, the equation we have to test is the following. Um, the density, right, is related to the texture of the order parameter. Right. So this would be the this would be the, 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 the electronic, the, basically the charge density with the two e. Right. So so um, how do we how do we do this? And so that's that's um, so this is what we came up with. Um, we will essentially work in the canonical ensemble and we will dope two holes right away from half of them. So we just put in two holes in, in our system. 
And we want to localize the spermion. If there is a spermion, that means we have to localize the pair. And to localize the pair, what we do is we just do, we modulate the chemical potential and just do a trap, right? Like this, so there's a trap like this in the system and the two holes basically are stuck in this trap and we will thereby localize the charge, right? The two charges we put in are localized at the origin. And then um, what we can do are measuring, so this is the quantum spin hole order parameter, this would correspond to this N if you want an immune flow picture. And then what we can do is to look at the JJ correlations from the origin to the boundary or to very far. I mean, this is a, you know, a periodic boundary condition, right? So, so from the origin to, to, the, to, the, to the largest distance of the system. And so what you see is something which, is, which looks like a spermule. So here I would have my spin up, right? A spin out, spin up. Here I have my spin down, right? So that would be up and down. And then we can't really capture this because we're only measuring, um, you know, uh, we, have, we have an SU2 invariant system. So uh, essentially what we believe is that here you would have your vortex, right? Something like this, and then this goes down. So we would really see um, a spermia. Meaning that, you know, this is, if somebody has a better idea how to do this, I'd be happy to talk about it. This is what we came up with to image the fact that this equation here actually holds, right? That the spin texture is linked, if you want, to the, um, to the charge density. So now we can go ahead and say, well, um, let's go away from the two hole and systematically dope and ask ourselves the question, what, what is the nature of the transition? And this, these are the results. Um, and of course, you know, you should ask yourself the question, what happens to the, what happens to the order when I dope? And what happens to, uh, you know, to the two orders essentially? So there is at, at zero doping, right? We have a quantum spin hole, insula quantum spin hole insulator. So we have the correlation ratio for the quantum spin hole grows. And then um, when we dope, right, let's put 0 0.01 doping, then essentially you lose the quantum spin off order. And if you follow these curves, um, rather, well, you should look at it a bit longer, but essentially you see that the crossing is always moving towards zero doping. And we have not, I mean, we have not been able to localize for the moment within our system size, a, 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 a crossing where this a, a system size, where this crossing sort of a, um, converges, meaning that, for our given system sizes and given um, a you know, doping, we're working in the canonical ensemble, we, the, the quantum spin hall insulating state disappears directly when you dope. Now, um, what happens to the superconducting? And the same thing happens essentially, the superconducting order parameter goes up right away. I mean, basically, as soon as we dope, um, we, we, we obtain a, a, a superconducting state. So, this is very different from, from what I'll come back to this later. Uh, from, from what you would expect from a mean field. Um, it's, um, so these are the, this is the, this is the conclusion. Uh, this is the conclusion of this. We have, a, we have a direct, I mean, we have a direct, within our, within our resolution, we have a direct and continuous doping induced transition between a quantum spin off insulator and an SOA superconductor. Doping is something which breaks Lorentz symmetry. So this is maybe not described by the conformal field theory, but the, there's a, at least from as far as I, See, there is still a question mark on how to understand this. Intuitively, you can say, well, you have spermions, you dope, you know, you, you dope your system, you have a proliferation of spermions, spermions because the pairs are spermions, and thereby you destroy the uh, you, you destroy the, the, the quantum spin on ordering and you generate superconductivity. But beyond this picture, I, I don't I don't I don't know how to go on. So and the 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 um, resolution we have is essentially this, which is you know, pretty remarkable in the sense that we, this number comes from essentially two holes on a 24 by 24 lattice. This is the type of doping we can, we can do. So um, now let me go on to um, another axis. Instead of doping, what we can do is stay at half filling where you would keep Lorentz uh, symmetry and ask ourselves the question, can we um, induce a sort of a transition at half filling? So that's what we call a bandwidth induced transition from this quantum spin hole to a, um, from a semi from a quantum spin hole here to the superconductor. Um, so what we have to, in principle, add to the model is a term which, um, which uh, reduces the energy of the, of, the, of the pair. One possibility is to say, well, let's take in a detractive U-term and then put in a U-term. And what we would obtain is one of the generic uh, phase diagrams. We have a semi-metal to superconductor here semi-metal to superconductor here, 
semi metal to quantum spin all here. And along this line here, we would have the desired transition, direct transition from the superconductor to the quantum spin -off. It turns out that we don't have to do this for our model. And that the, the phase diagram looks more like something like this, right? Where if you just stay along this axis as a function of lambda, then you go from semi metal, you have an island of quantum spin on, and then you go back to the superconductor. So this is the this is confirmed by, by these plots. So this is now always at half filling. We are changing uh, the value of lambda. So this is the strength of this special interaction we cooked up, and um, we lose our quantum spin hall. Uh, we lose the quantum spin hall state at around this point. We at the same point, if you do the extrapolation, right, as a function of one over L, at the same point we obtain um, a S wave um, superconductivity, right? So, um, and the um, so it seems to be a direct transition. It seems to be continuous. And what's important, it's a it's a bosonic transition in the sense that the single particle gap here stays open across the transition. So there are no there are no fermions in this whole thing. Good. So of course. Both transitions are, are not mean field transitions. Right? I mean, if you do mean field, then um, you will you will get you know you have two different orders. You will get coexistence first order, some intermediate phase, or you know some very fine tuning if we don't want to if we don't want to think about. It. So well, which we can check after, right? Because we can check we can we can we can change the imaginary time discretizations in our simulations. If it were fine tuning, then even this imaginary time discretization would do something, right? So and we haven't noticed. So um, this is, you know, what if you did a mean field? So Senju came up with it. We can do a mean field for this model, and you know, the mean field is not so surprising. It falls into a gauss boulanda and you would have essentially here quantum spin off to um, to the super superconductor. That's a coexistence of the two orders. Of course, the superconducting phase breaks um, the topological superconductivity U1 symmetry. If you break U1 symmetry, then you, you kill the, the topological product protection of the, of the quantum spin all state. And along this line here, this line here, I put my pointer up again, this line here is a first order transition. So, so you know, mean field is will not explain, will not explain the AC. And of course, to explain what uh, what we see at least at half filling, right, where you have lower end symmetry, is um, the notion of deconfined quantum criticality. Um, and I'll show you that this applies also to our model where um, you have, where topology plays a big role. Where, for example, here, um, if you have a VBS, right? VBS is a fourfold degenerate uh, state. If you put a vortex um, in this uh, C4, a Z4 vortex in this, um, in the background of the, of the, you know, for the, the four possible VBS state at the center, you will automatically get a spin on. And, you know, the, the theories of deconfined quantum criticality they are they are centered around this object, this spin-on. In um, it's, it's a gauge object with their gauge charge, and which is described by the non-compact uh, CP1 theory. Right. So this is the um, the idea of EQCP, where you have an emergent fractionalized particle in an emergent theory. Exactly, it's an emergent deconfined theory. Exactly at um, the quantum critical point. So let me quickly go through the 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 Dirac way of understanding. Quantum, deconfined quantum criticality, which is which I think is, is, is beautiful and which allows you to to make connections with different with different uh, 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 with, with, with different types of transitions. So the, the key point is that the quantum spin hall mass terms, right? So this is now in the Bogoluboff um, uh, the, the Bogoluboff index because we will have superconductivity. The quantum spin hall mass terms they are part of the quintuplet of mass terms where the two others two remaining are basically the S wave superconductor. And that's the key point, the algebra. You could also um, do this, all the calculation that we'll do now, you could also do it for, let's assume that we would have a, um, a, a quantum spin hall, that that will be um, an SDW mass term, and we would have the two Kikule terms. So let me see, gamma zero, gamma three, and then I gamma zero, gamma five. Uh, maybe I got it wrong, I think that's correct. So this would be another, another quintuplet of, of Dirac mass terms, where a um, which anti commute, right? And so everything we will do now can be done also for these other quintuplets. Um, the, 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 um, the Lagrangian we will write to describe such a phase diagram here is um, again your free, your Dirac fermions. 
And there are Yukawa coupled to the quantum spin hall masterings with a three component field and to the superconducting masterings with a U1, U1 field phi. Then you put this into a five component field, which is phi. The important point is that L of the, the LF, just the fermion Lagrangian, has an SO5 symmetry because the, these, these five mass terms, they anti commute. So we, we'll talk about this again later. So that's an SO5 symmetry. Now, because of this, there, there's, so, so, you know, with this type of Lagrangian, of course, there's, you know, dynamics of the bosons, which we will, which will, you know, uh, which will. You know, lower the energy from the, the symmetry from SO5 to SO3 times U1 as it would be in our case. Now, of course, this will, uh, this will capture these transitions, these crossover transitions. It will also capture this tricritical point, which is, uh, um, which is uh, believed to have emergent SO5 symmetry. I think Dipan will talk about this this afternoon. And, but what we're interested in is, is this transition here. Now at this transition here, how we worked it out, is essentially there is no, there is the single particle gap does not close. Now, because okay. of, yes. You've got five plus five minutes left. Five plus five minutes left. Okay. That's, that's good enough. Um, so a, the single particle gap, uh, because of the SO5 symmetry, the single particle gap is essentially just proportional to the norm of this, of this five component vector, right? And it doesn't close it. So we can forget the, the fluctuations the amplitude fluctuations of this order parameter and just look at the phase fluctuations. And you can integrate out then the, the, um, the, the you can integrate out the, um, uh, the fermions and you will obtain essentially an, uh, a non an SO5 nonlinear signal model with a Vesumino Witten term. This is the all important term, which tells you that, you know, um, a vortex and basically two of the five components generates a spin on, et cetera. And then you have also then the, the symmetry breaking um, a bosonic term. Okay, so this tells you two things, right? One thing is that um, if you follow this path, then you can very easily see that the transition from SEW to VBS or Kikule, or the transition from the quantum spin hall to a uh, superconductor should be the same in the same universality class. It also tells you that um, maybe that they, if there is some, and there are signs of emergent SO5 symmetry in the DQCT, so that this would be relevant. That the, the the critical theory at the critical point of DQCT, we should is related to this SO5, um, a nonlinear signal model with this um, topological term. So these are two things we would like to actually check. And I think given the time, I will only be able to check one. Um, one thing. So we calculated the exponents, right? So these are now um, a summary of exponents for DQCTs for you know three extremely different models. One is the JQ model, you know, introduced by Anders. Others are the loop models introduced by Adam Nahum, right? And they have the, they have, uh, you know, exponents that are, are okay with each other. They have a, a lower symmetry than our model. That's important because that means that we have the SO3 times Z4. That means that uh, the quadruple, uh, um, uh, quadruple multiples are, are allowed. Um, we have a higher symmetry. This is a quantum spin off to superconduct and higher symmetry. The skirmions are conserved because the charge is conserved. So we do not have these dangerously irrelevant operators, which could, you know, at one point were believed to pose some problems. And so we indeed get, you know, within our, within our accuracy, we indeed get, you know, a, um, a um, exponent which uh, really, uh, which, which, which really match. Good. So, I think I will, you know, just tell you maybe one more thing on the last part. Um, and this is, um, the, the aim here is to find a way of simulating this field theory. Right? And of course, if you try to put this on a lattice, right, the way we did it before, then you will never get the SO5 symmetry. You will always get a lower symmetry SO3 times um, U1, and you will, you know, maybe at a, at, a, at a special point, the symmetry will be emergent, but you will not be able to enforce it. And um, the, the, the tricks of these two papers is to use a, um, to use a, um, a Landau level regularization scheme, right, for the, to, um, to achieve this. So, so um, what we do, essentially, we work on the, on the zero of Landau level. So the Landau level we use is in the continuum. And uh, we, so this, this operator would generate um, working Landau gauge, you have a good 
momentum for the lambda um, KY for the for the for the for this electron in the in the nano level, and then we restrict this only to the n equals zero. So this has a, this has canonical commutation rule. This is projected and has no canonical commutation. And the space here is of course finite, right? I mean we have n phi states four times n phi because there has an this this level here has a fourfold degenerate um, index has an SU four um, symmetry. So in this space, right, we can define a model which has an SU four term, right? And essentially five mass terms. So these these tau z and sigma they act on the uh, they act essentially on the alpha, right? Those four alphas, and they are five anti-commuting mass terms. Right? Now at a very special point, so these are the these are the five masses, and um, the you know if you have five mass terms, you can build a commutator of the five mass terms. You will get ten operators, which turn out to be the generators of the SO five symmetry. And exactly, if you put UK, which is particularly equal to the UM, which is the you know, magnetic mass, SO3 magnetic mass are equal, then you will show that this model, which we really simulate, right? In which we'll be able to simulate, has um, the SO5 symmetry. Now, how is this related to our to our to the to what we want to do? Um, you can follow a paper from, from me and Sashdev. And at the SO5 symmetric point, what you can do is a rather lengthy calculation, which is I think, not so easy to, to get you know, all the factors right, you know, the G, et cetera. But in principle, you can do Hubbard Sotonovich uh, decouplings of this, integrate out the fermions, and then you will get essentially this desired uh, field theory. Okay. So, so what, is the, what is the result? I think I really should, should move on. You can, you can tell me to stop or the, uh, but yeah, so, so, so the result is the following. Um, the result is the following, is that, um, again, the results are interesting, but ambiguous. Um, they, um, they, uh, the, the, so we're going to do simulations that UK is equal to UM equals U, this is one, so we have one thing, and we will just change U0, and you should see U0 as changing the G, right, changing the state. Um, so the first thing to see is to be sure that we have an insulating state, and so this is the charge susceptibility, and for all the U0s, from minus one, where you know, from minus one to infinity, we see they're very big. We see we see an insulating state. Now, um, what is the what is the phases? What are the phases of this of this um, of this insulating state? And these are the correlation ratios again, right? Correlation ratios for the SO five um, order parameter. And you see that there you see that there is there is a there is a U zero here where there seems to be a crossing. On the right hand side, this this is really growing. But on the left-hand side, it's a bit ambiguous because it seems to scale to something which is fun. It doesn't seem to go to zero as in disordered state. If you take the same data and you plot it as one over the number of flux quantum, or that's essentially one over the system size or the size of the Hilbert space, then you will see that we, we, have, we have the tendency of, this should go to zero if it's disordered. So zero is way down there, but it seems to go to something which is finite, meaning that we have a critical state. So at the you know at U, at the small u zeros we could interpret the result as something critical, and at big u zeros what this turns up, and we certainly would have a um, a, uh, a an order state. So strictly speaking, what we can say from the data are only two things. Unfortunately, um, we have an ordered phase that that's quite clear. You know, this really goes up, and we can and we can really have. I think I'm, I'm quite convinced of that. Um, and the only thing we can really say is that um, at small u zeros, the correlation length basically exceeds the system sizes we have. Right? And um, from there onward, you can you can do a lot of interpretation. Um, the interpretation which I favor is is the is the following. Uh, there is is this one is basically if I if you think about this as the symmetry breaking axis, so alpha equals zero would be the SO five. This would be the SO the, the, the u one phase. This would be the SO three phase. Along this SO5, you have an ordered state, you have a critical point, and basically an SO5 CFT, right? Now, if this is the case, essentially, that would mean that um, this point here is basically the critical point of the DQCP with emergent SO5 symmetry. And you would, you know, if you break the symmetry, you will go to the VBS or you go um, to the AFM. Of course, one possibility is that. I'll, I'll skip that thing. One, if you, you know, if you show this phase diagram to Adam Mayhem, the first thing he will tell you is, well, very nice. But most probably, what will happen because of, you know, there's a lot of insight, of, you know, from formal bootstrap that the SO5 symmetry is maybe not present. Um, maybe the most probable thing which happens is that these two 
points here, fixed points, they collide, they become complex, and we get essentially a very slow flow if you want. So that would mean that I would always have a, an ordered phase. And then if you go back to the, um, to the phase diagram of VPCP, you would have a very slow flow and sort of like a, you know, an approximate um, SO5 uh, symmetry. So this is one interpretation of the results. Go to the paper and read more if you want to discuss with me this afternoon. So um, apologies for, the, for being late. Um, these are the conclusions. Um, the take home message is that um, I think that this is very exciting because I think we can do, uh, at least I'm excited about it in the sense that you can really do simulations compared to experiments. I mean, there's a lot of extremely interesting experiments you go through that require very large lattices if you want to get some convincing results. Um, then these are toy models, right? Um, the skirmion superconductivity, basically, the, this quantum phase transition from quantum spin hall to SSC as a, at half filling is an instance of a deconfined quantum criticality. This point here could be an SO5 CFT in which we can actually simulate with the, this Landau level regularization scheme. And um, the thing which is really unknown for the moment is understanding this doping induced transition. It's not a Lorentz invariant transition. And um, yeah, so, so I don't, we don't have a theory for that for the moment. So thank you very much. And apologies for being late, right? Thank you. Thank you, Father. Thanks. Thanks for the very insightful and dense talk. I think we should still um, have a few questions, maybe the short questions. I have a very quick question. Yes, please. The, uh, in your, your two particle doped uh, skirmion, right. uh, is it a block? Is it a, there's these different skirmions, you know, block or DL skirmion? Can you, can you tell Ooh. which kind it is? No, no, I'm sorry, I will not be. I, no, I don't know that. I don't know that. Okay. No. Uh, That's your money? Yeah. Uh, sorry. I don't even know if you could distinguish. There's a question by Hachamani. Um, my question has to do with uh, the skirmion uh, you have put in. Uh, actually, I see it right now on the screen. Because of periodic boundary conditions for a vertex, you have an anti-vertex, no? Um, well, the, the skirmion will fit on the lattice. One single skirmion will fit on the lattice, right? So if I look at the vertex that you have drawn here, because yeah. of periodic boundary conditions, it doesn't go back. Well, if you if you would not um, know, because the, because you can, I agree that if you have a vertex and basically the your arrow would be in a plane, then it would have to go back, right? But I agree. But the skirmion, this is this is this is a configuration which I can do very well with periodic boundary conditions. I see. Right, and because I can I can so the vertex is here, but it will. Basically, the, the vortex is, you know, a lot. It's, it's somehow like a, a skirmion is, yeah. So, so you, you can um, you can get rid of it by, you know, going into a plane perpendicular to the vortex. So that that will fit on a, on, a, on a periodic boundary on a torque. I see. I see. So there is no reason to put twisted boundary conditions. No, no, not for this one. For vortices, no. yes, we would have to put. Yeah, for vortices, yeah, for this one, actually not. We could do that. We did, we did the calculation explicitly, right? You can do this in, in this calculation here. You could explicitly put in a skirmion here, right? You could explicitly put in a skirmion here. And um, on, the, on last, you can do the calculation. Very nice. You can just put a, a, an upspin, an upspin at the center of your hexagon. And then you have to be sure that your skirmion is small enough to, fall, to, to, to fit on, the, on, on, the, on your lattice and that the boundary you're always down. That's perfectly okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I feel we have to move on, but uh, I encourage every one of you to use the Gather Town session to continue the discussions uh, with Falker. Uh, the next talk will be by Lukas Jansen. Lukas, are you around? Yes, yes, I'm around. Um, Great. And let me try to start this here. Um, Okay, I hope you can see my screen. Yes, perfectly, thank you. So okay, great. Next speaker is uh, Lukas Janssen. 
uh, Leyson telling us all about quantum criticality between spin liquids at long range order. Please. Yes. Okay. Um, thanks. Um, yeah, thanks also everyone else uh, of the organizers um, for um, setting up this extremely interesting program and also for the invitation to speak. Today, I'm uh, going to discuss phase transitions in flatland systems. And these are particular phase transitions where at least one of the adjacent phases features an emergent gauge field. In fact, I will argue that the presence of these unconventional excitations leads to new and unusual type of quantum criticality. Um, so in this work, uh, uh, we have done basically uh, on the one hand side, uh, um, numerical calculations that were performed mainly by Xiaoyang Shu, who's a former student of uh, Xiang Meng's group. And then I'll, I'll also discuss some works that were done together with uh, Urban Seifert, who has now moved to Santa Barbara as a postdoc. But I'll also mention uh, in passing a work, uh, related work of this actually uh, with my student, Shoja Ray, uh, and our organizer, John Gracie, and, and Michael Scherer's group. And more details on, on this part will actually be given in, in, in Shoja's talk this afternoon. So uh, this session is called uh, Condensed Matter Applications, and, and therefore I couldn't really resist to, to explain at least a bit, little bit of where uh, the physics that I will be describing could at least in principle be realized in, in actual materials. So I will therefore start by explaining how two plus one dimensional gauge fields can emerge in spin models. And I will describe a mechanism that uh, we call uh, spin fractionalization. And then I will discuss two particular specific examples. And uh, the first one will be an effective uh, yeah, lattice model uh, describing a compact QD3. And that is actually the same lattice model that was also discussed yesterday in, in Joseph's talk. And in, uh, in, in, in a second example, I will describe a microscopic spin orbital model that in fact can be mapped to a Z2 gauge theory with fermions. I will then conclude. So what do I mean with fractionalization and, and what is spin liquid? Well, uh, fractionalization is a surprising phenomenon that uh, can only occur in, in, in a strongly interacting many body system. In order to understand why this is really an unexpected effect, let me uh, start by reviewing what we actually know for composites of, of free or weakly interacting particles. So let me just consider the simplest uh, situation, uh, two, three uh, spins one half, something that we consider in quantum mechanics. And when we want to make a composite object out of this. And of course, we all know uh, that there are just uh, two possibilities. This composite can be arranged in either a spin zero singlet or in a spin one triplet. In any of these cases, however, uh, the composite will always have an integer spin. And in fact, uh, is there a question? Okay. Oh, uh, so in any case, any any such composite uh, will 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 have integer spin, and and that has actually also remains true if we consider uh, an arbitrary even number of such spins one half. Of course, if these spins one half interact, then of course we can also have collective excitations, and that will, in most cases, actually will be uh, uh, the, um, uh, the the relevant low energy excitations such as magnons. Uh, these are the quanta of the spin waves. But again, these are integer spin objects in this case because they arise from spin flips, basically. Uh, these are spin one objects and this again described effectively by the bosonic field theory. And this is in fact generically true. Um, the quantum numbers of any composite object uh, or, or a collective excitation is always an integer multiple of the quantum numbers of the, uh, the, the, the composite object is, is made of the constituents. Spin liquid now describes a situation in a strongly interacting system in which the low, ener low energy excitations actually do not no longer fulfill this rule. Spin liquid is therefore a state of matter where the collective excitations are fractionalized. And in that we mean that these excitations have quantum numbers that are not just simple integer multiples 
of the quantum numbers of the original constituents the system is made of in the first place. And formally, uh, this can actually be understood in some type of part on decomposition. So uh, think of, uh, say, uh, spin one half operators, SI, on a regular lattice with lattice site I. And in fact, uh, they satisfy, of course, the SU2 spin algebra. But this algebra uh, can be fully represented by fermion bilinears in, in, in precisely this way. Uh, so psi bus, sigma psi, basically where sigma are just usual uh, two by two poly matrices, but these operators psi are now fermion operators satisfying the canonical anti-commutation re relations for, for fermions. This uh, decomposition, however, introduces a gauge redundancy that can be observed already on, on, on the simple level. We can basically always uh, um, multiply an arbitrary phase at each lattice site uh, to, this, uh, to, to these fermions, psi, and that leaves this decomposition uh, invariant and, and, and therefore also leaves the Hamiltonian, any spin Hamiltonian that only has spins, uh, spin operators uh, invariant. So in a way, uh, this decomposition, uh, uh, or in this decomposition, we, we trade these spins uh, by, by uh, a system of fermions that interact via an emergent gauge field. This is, of course, a very formal step and, and, and can be done for any spin system. Uh, however, uh, uh, in, 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 uh, I mean, even in a conventional system, say some uh, Heisenberg spin model on a bipartite lattice, however, in, the, in such conventional systems, the spin-ons, these fermionic operators, are always in confined phase. That is, they cannot exist as isolated particles. They do not play any role for the spectrum. The main question, therefore, is can we find a model, or at best more models, many models, that feature phases where we have deconfined spin-ons? That is where the rele relevant low energy degrees of freedom are fractionalized. And in fact, such a model is, is now known, and it's the Kitaev Honeycomb model. This is actually a seemingly simple model where such a fascinating effect is possible to show explicitly, uh, exactly. It has been introduced by Kitaev, and it features uh, spins one half on the sides of honeycomb lattice uh, with an easing type of interaction. However, uh, the spin quantization axis now depends on the direction of the bond. So basically, we have three types of bonds uh, marked here as, as blue, uh, green, and red. And on these different three types, we have an easing X, easing Y, and easing Z interaction. So remarkably, uh, this model can be solved exactly by using such kind of part on decomposition. And with this decomposition, we actually can map exactly the spin model to lattice gauge field theory. And in this theory, uh, we instead of having the spin operator sigma, we now have Majorana fermions, so uh, fermionic operators, which are Hermitian, we call these Majoranas, uh, and, and they interact via a, 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 well, these bond operators, UIJ. These are also Hermitian operators, in fact, uh, uh, have eigenvalues plus or minus one and live on, on, a, on the links of this lattice. So basically, these can be understood as a Z2 gauge field. Importantly, uh, these, these bond operators, UIJ, are static operators in the sense that they commute with the Hamiltonian and they also commute with all themselves, among themselves. So we can basically diagonalize simultaneously the Hamiltonian with all these bond operators. That's a remarkable situation. And that allows this exact solution of this model. So the ground state of this model now describes real fermion operators, Majorana fermions, that hop on a background of a static Z2 gauge field. It's a Z2 quantum spin liquid describing. Then can such a fractionalized phase be realized in actual material? That's, that's one of important question. In fact, um, a material that is believed to feature strong Kitaev interaction is alpha ruthenium trichloride. This is effectively a flatland system because it consists of just weakly bond honeycomb layers of, of ruthenium ions. The system is an excellent insulator at low temperatures. So naively, you would expect that no, no fermions at all playing a role in a, in a low energy spectrum. 
And indeed, the ground state of plain ruthenium trichloride is a more or less ordinary so-called zigzag type of antifire magnet. However, this long range order can be uh, uh, suppressed rather easily by a moderate external magnetic field. And what we find then is actually uh, that there is a quantum critical point at around seven Tesla. And there is a novel type of quantum paramagnet with exotic properties in, in, in a finite field range between seven and 11 Tesla. This uh, quantum paramagnet actually features a thermal quantum Hall effect and also characteristic quantum oscillations in heat transfer. These are properties that we actually only know from Fermi liquids. So things like if the, this looks as if it were a, a metal. However, tra charge transport shows that this is an excellent insulator. So where do these charge neutral fermions come from? Well, whether or not uh, this is indeed the realization of a quantum spin liquid that has been a matter of an intense debate in the recent years and uh, we're not going to solve that today. Uh, so here I'd rather take this just as a motivation to ask the following question. Assuming that we do have a quantum spin liquid and we do have a quantum critical point just into this uh, quantum spin liquid, how would the presence of these fractionalized excitations in the quantum spin liquid affect the quantum critical behavior? What's the influence of the spin-ons and, and the gauge field for uh, the critical exponents of the spectrum? So let me come to my first example. Uh, and here I'll describe the transition between the U1 spin liquid state, so where, where the emergent gauge field is the U1 uh, gauge field, and also where we have gapless deconfined spin-ons in this U1 spin liquid. And on the other hand, we have an ordered state, and in this case, it's a valence bond ordered state. And in this state, spin-ons are confined, so with a confining potential. So this can be understood as a flatland kind of but zero temperature version of a confinement transition. So we have studied in fact a flattest model that features both a spin liquid phase and, and also a transition to such a long range ordered phase uh, using sign problem free quantum Monte Carlo simulations. And I refer to this model as lattice compact QD3 as it involves both uh, uh, gapless fermions psi uh, and, and these fermions psi, they, they, they live on, on the sides of the square lattice, but it you know, also involves the coupling uh, to a compact U1 gauge field uh, phi that, that lives on, uh, on the links of this lattice. Then uh, we have this term K here uh, that uh, for, for positive K basically favors a five flux configuration of this, uh, of, of this gauge field. So at the single particle level, we would expect that these are kind of Dirac fermions uh, describing, uh, uh, well, the spectrum consists of Dirac fermions with Fermi level basically at, uh, at, 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 this, at this touching point or crossing point and half filling. However, model has also a tuning parameter J uh, that is basically the second term here. And this tuning parameter J basically controls the dynamics of this gauge field. So for small J, uh, gauge fluctuations are suppressed and therefore we expect that we have a disordered ground state characterized by gapless Dirac fermion interacting via this fluctuating U1 gauge field. This is the U1 Dirac spin liquid that we expect for, for, for deconfined, uh, uh, sorry, decon for the deconfined. For increasing J, however, uh, gauge fluctuations become strong and can eventually drive a transition uh, to, towards some ordered state. And uh, previous quantum Monte Carlo simulations uh, uh, define such an ordered state and suggest that it's a, it's a valence bond solid phase where basically neighboring spin singlets, uh, uh, neighboring spins form spin singlets. This obviously breaks the lattice rotational symmetry. And, and therefore, uh, um, yeah, we, we, we must have some, um, some kind of transition in between at least one. And the finite size scaling analysis uh, suggestive of uh, that there is a single transition and it appears to even be continuous quantum critical point. So if this interpretation is really correct, then what would be uh, the appropriate minimal field theory describing this transition the continuum limit? Well, if this were a usual Landau transition, then we would expect some kind of XY 
uh, or O2 bosonic field theory describing the transition with an order parameter phi, a real complex, uh, sorry, a, a real uh, two component uh, uh, boson field uh, corresponding basically to the two directions in, on a two dimensional lattice. However, here we do have at the transition also gapless fermionic degrees of freedom, uh, 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 Dirac fermions basically, psi, and we also have a gauge field uh, under, under which uh, basically these fermions are charged. So the simplest model that we can write down that is consistent with this field contract is this kind of QD3 Gosnevu XY field theory. And in fact, using large N and epsilon expansion, we were able to uh, kind of uh, show that it has a, has a stable renormalization group fixed point. And uh, also what comes out of this calculation are, are leading order estimates for critical exponents and scaling dimensions for, for, uh, for fermion bilinears that will be useful to compare with an numeric state. But most importantly, for large enough at least, uh, the monopole fugacity Z is a dangerously irrelevant parameter at the quantum critical point. So that basically means that the non-compactness of the gauge field uh, can be uh, can be basically ignored at the quantum critical point. Monopoles basically are irrelevant. So uh, that's actually crucial for for our field theory because uh, only this way we can basically do uh, and do the analytical calculations because we basically assume at the critical point non-compact one gauge field. However, once a uh, a gap in the spin on spectrum so in the fermion spectrum. Is, is kind of induced by the order, then the monopole operators actually do become relevant and that drive the confinement of the charges. And that's basically why we end up in the end. Uh, so where's my pointer? Um, somehow I'm lost it, um, but it uh, doesn't really matter. Um, so everything's kind of, uh, can you still hear me? Hello? Yes, Hello? we do hear you. Yes, yes. Okay, somehow my computer is frozen. Let me try to. Huh. Sorry, sorry for that. Ah. Maybe I stop the speech here and then you start again. Yes, uh, I, the only thing is I, I, I don't have any control over my computer anymore at all. Um, well, then let's try. Um, I can stop the sh screen share. Shall I try that? Yes, yes, please try it. Yes, that'd be great. Ah. So Lucas is going, he probably tries to reconnect. Well, while we are waiting for Lucas, maybe um, let me um, make an advertisement for the post session starting later today after Lucas' talk. Um, you may have already seen a couple of posters during the past uh, two days. Uh, that was just for fun. Now today is the official series post session. So there are lots of uh, contributions from particular younger people. So I'd, I'd like to invite you to really make use of uh, this post session this afternoon.
Lucas is yeah, back. Lucas back. Yes. Yeah. Hi. So I'll I'll try it again, and uh, we'll see what's happening. Um, okay. Yeah, looks good. It's good. Okay, so let, then let me just skip to the correct slide where I was. Was this one here? Okay, so let's see. Um, I don't have a pointer yet, but I think we'll 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 make it even without a pointer. Uh, so anyway, um, the point here is that the monopore fugacity is irrelevant at the quantum critical point, but it becomes relevant once the fermions acquire a band gap. And that's the confined phase. So this quantum critical point basically describes a continuous transition between a confined XY ordered phase, the VBS phase, and a deconfined Dirac spin liquid phase. So let me now show you that the theoretical predictions for this exotic universality class are in fact consistent with the QMC data. And to this end, let me compare three different scenarios. And the first one is kind of the conventional scenario where we just have an XY uh, transition, uh, forgetting about all this uh, fractionized stuff. And then we would have just the usual XY exponents. Second scenario takes the presence of this gapless Dirac fermion degrees of freedom into account. And we all know that then the, uh, by now that, that the exponents of course crucially depend on this. And particularly we would have a much more larger uh, order parameter anomalous dimension eta pi. Third scenario now is this QD3 gross nouveau XY scenario, where again, we would have significantly different uh, um, uh, yeah, critical exponents. So if we now compare uh, the scaling uh, plots for this VBS correlation ratio uh, for these three different scenarios, we basically see that in the first scenario, there's basically no, uh, no data collapse at all. And that basically already rules out this conventional scenario. This is not a usual XY transition, although it's described by an XY order parameter. The difference in the quality of the scaling plots in these other two scenarios is, is actually uh, less significant. So in this case, uh, we therefore have looked at the fermion bilinear scaling dimensions as a function of one over an F. And here we see a crucial difference. So while, while in the second scenario, uh, uh, we see a decrease of Delta VBS with one over an S, uh, one over an F, we see an increase of Delta VBS with one over an F uh, in the third scenario. So that's basically uh, these blue dash lines. And while of course there's no perfect coincidence with, uh, with, with, with the data points from the, from the quantum Monte Carlo, at least the general trend is the same uh, uh, in, in the quantum Monte Carlo than in the third scenario. And it's inconsistent with the second scenario. So this basically rules out the second scenario and left, leaves us with the third scenario. Of course, uh, again, there are recognizable deviations in particular when NF is small, but when looking at this whole set of exponents, that more or less looks consistent and we overall see a satisfying agreement and that becomes particularly convincing when NF is large. So we really do understand this as a solid evidence for the interpretation that this quantum critical point is really in the QD3 gross nouveau XY universality class. So let me come to my uh, second, uh, uh, to my second part. Uh, and, and let me just ask Holger, how much time do I actually have? do have? Well, you still have, uh, if I subtract the, the break, um, 20 plus 5, oh, 19, that's 19 plus 5. That's, that's more than perfect. Great. So we'll have enough time. That's great. Um, so in the second example, now I'll describe a transition uh, between a uh, spin on semi-metal with emergent Z2 gauge field and a long range ordered magnetic state um, where the spin-ons are gapped, but not confined. So this is in a sense, a spin-on semi-metal insulator transition. It's not a confinement transition. And this is actually an example where, where we can really write down a microscopic model that does not feature 
any fermionic degrees of freedom, at least not, not no obvious fermionic degrees of freedom. Um, because we, we basically start with the spin orbital generalization of the Kitaev model. So this in a sense is a purely bosonic model, if you like. I mean, naively, without any many body uh, phenomena it, at a single particle level, if you, if you think of it, that there would be a bosonic field theory. So uh, to, to make the point here, I'll, I'll discuss a simple toy model on a square lattice and a more realistic type of model will be discussed by Shodra in this afternoon session. And, and, and also besides the difference in the lattice, there are actually two further differences in this model as compared to the original Kitaev model. Uh, the first difference is that we assume not only a spin sitting on each letter side, but we assume an, another degeneracy uh, that gives us actually uh, more, more freedom and the, the ways of interaction that we, we can add to this, uh, to this term. And so we, we assume and that's, that's basically the first uh, generalization of this, if you like, uh, not only a twofold degeneracy, but a fourfold degeneracy. And physically, you could speak of this that uh, you don't only have spin degree of freedom, but also you have an orbital degeneracy. That's why we call it a spin orbital model. So that's the first difference. Second difference, now that we have more, more degrees of freedom, we can add some type of interactions that we, that, that we like for our toy model here. And for this particular toy model, uh, we, we, uh, we, we think of, of a, a, um, uh, an, an interaction uh, Jz, uh, it's a spin-spin interaction parameterized by this parameter Jz. So that is the second difference that we add this spin-spin uh, unfrustrated interaction to this spin uh, Kitaev type of uh, uh, term, which is the first term in this Hamiltonian. So for Jz equals zero, uh, this Hamiltonian can actually be shown to be equivalent to a known model. This known model features the spin orbital liquid and can be shown in the same way similarly uh, but more or less the same way we, as, as a Kitaev model. So uh, that is actually stable to small interactions and therefore we expect, we expect an extended spin orbital liquid ground state uh, for small JZ. And we call it the Kitaev spin orbital liquid. It features gapless spin-ons, but for large JZ then eventually we expect a transition towards a state where, where, uh, where the second term, this interaction term, JZ term, that actually induces magnetic order because it's an easing interaction, it's an easing magnetic order. And if JZ is positive, it would be an antiferromagnetic easing order. So these are the two limits. And the question is what's actually the phase diagram in between? Uh, is there a direct transition, transition between these two states or is there something in between? Uh, what's the nature of the transitions and so on? Remarkably for this particular toy model, this question can be answered numerically exactly because we can map the ground state sector of this, uh, of this model uh, to a fermionic model that features relativistic flatland fermions. And this is done as follows. So uh, we use a part on decomposition now similar to the, the Kitaev case, original Kitaev case, but uh, in, instead of having just four Majorana fermions as in the Kitaev model, we now introduce six Majorana flavors per lattice site. And I denote these as CX, CY, and B1 through B4. And these two C Majorana fermions, CX and CY, that can, that can be actually, actually combined into a single complex fermion and that I should maybe call F. And these B operators, these B Majorana fermions, they can be combined into bosonic operators, squares by basically of these Bs, uh, that actually become in the end a Z2 gauge field on this square lattice. So by doing that, we can actually rewrite this microscopic spin orbital model exactly in terms of a hopping model of, of fermions on this square lattice subject to an interaction. And this interaction is actually nothing else but just the nearest neighbor repulsion uh, of these spinless fermions on this square lattice. So that's, that's basically how we devise this model to obtain this particular, uh, th this particular fermionic model. And importantly, now this gauge field U again is a static gauge field. So it commutes with the Hamiltonian, commutes among all, the, all these operators themselves. It can be diagonalized simultaneously with the Hamiltonian. And that's, that's the most important point here 
because that basically tells us what the ground state is. And uh, we can use Leib's theorem uh, uh, to, to, to actually argue that actually the ground state must have a pi flux configuration. And that's also what we find actually in the actual diagonalization of the Samatonian. So it has a ground state, uh, the ground state has pi flux configuration of this C2 gauge field. And basically what's happening here is that the ground state sector of, of, of this gauge field configuration that actually maps the k type spin or, or of this k type spin model or maps exactly to this model of spinless complex fermions on pi flux lattice subject to nearest neighbor repulsion. This is, however, of course, a very well known model in the literature and in, in particular in this community. Uh, importantly, this precisely this model uh, is a minimal to sign problem for quantum Monte Carlo simulations, has been done a lot in the literature in the recent years, and we can basically uh, adopt these available results. For instance, those uh, published by, by, by Emily and Shailish, who simulated basically precisely this model on lattices with up to 64 by 64 sites. So in, in, in this case, uh, there, there then is, is a direct transition uh, as, as found between a disordered Dirac semi-metallic phase at weak interaction and a long range ordered phase at, at a large interaction or for large repulsion. And this long range ordered phase is is, is can be understood as a charge density wave. This transition is in the gross level Z2 universality class. It's an easing, uh, easing order parameter. Uh, and, and the critical exponents are by now fairly well known, uh, thanks to uh, also work of this community, including, in fact, all, all, all the four organizers of this workshop. So we can basically use these results to go back now to our Kitaev spin orbital model and map this fermionic theory back or fermionic phase diagram back to the spin orbital phase diagram. And if we do that, we precisely get back the phases that we expected from the previous slide. So what's happening here is that this Dirac semi-metallic phase actually maps to this K-type spin orbital liquid phase. The charge density wave phase now max maps to this antifermionic uh, spin, uh, easing spin ordered phase. We can also determine the critical coupling just from these fermionic uh, computations. And, and there's bas basically just a, a factor of two involved here. So in the end, get just half the value of the critical V of the fermionic model of the pi flux model. Also the critical exponents nu and eta phi precisely agree in, in the spin orbital model. However, we now need to, need to uh, rethink that actually the, the, the mapping only worked for, for the ground state sector, actually we're here, uh, we're here in, in the theory is actually here, a, 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 the ground state sector of Z2 lattice gauge field series. So there is a Z2 redundancy gauge symmetry. And this actually has important consequences of the spectrum because it forbids particular states that are allowed in, 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 in the ungauged theory. Even though the gauge field is gapped, it has consequences for the universality class. So what's the difference of this fractionalized universality class, we call it gross number Z2 star here in comparison to its conventional counterpart. So in order to understand this, let me go back to the bosonic transitions where uh, similar things have been studied in, in detail previously. So in this case, uh, let me compare the transverse field easing model uh, with the transverse field toric code model, uh, both as a function of tuning parameter magnetic field strength H. Obviously the easing model has a transition in a conventional two plus one dimensional easing universality class. In this case, it's a transition between usual uh, easing long range ordered phase and a conventional paramagnetic phase. The Torre code model, however, features a gapped spin, quantum spin liquid phase and therefore also a fractionalized uh, uh, universality class. And it's usually called easing star in the literature. So two plus one dimensional easing star universality class. The main difference between these two universality classes becomes most obvious when we look at finite size spectra right at the quantum critical point. These spectra can be measured in, in uh, exact angularization calculations and quantum Monte Carlo simulations. They can also actually be estimated in, in epsilon expansion calculations. If these spectra, uh, these numbers, energy eigenvalues are appropriately rescaled with L linear system size, then we get finite energies in the thermodynamic limits. And these finite numbers are universal quantities characterizing 
the universality class. And if we compare this, even though some of the critical exponents, for example, are new in this case, precisely agree between these two universality classes, the spectrum differs. Some of the states, for example, uh, the low-lying state uh, in, on our left-hand side, this sigma t, which corresponds to the, uh, to the order parameter in the, in the conventional class, easing, is missing on the right-hand side. So there is no order parameter sigma state in the easing star uh, universal, uh, universality class spectrum. And that is because this state is forbidden by gauge symmetry. On the other hand, on the right-hand side, we have additional topological copies, uh, uh, such as these one uh, T prime and one T double prime states that are not present in the easing uh, conventional spectrum. And these are associated with different eigenvalues of the Wilson loop operators winding around the torus. So we expect a similar distinct finite say spectroscopy also for the fermionic systems. Uh, this spectrum actually uh, for the ordinary gross nervosity two year universality class has been measured recently and actually is discussed in great detail also in Thomas Lang's paper. And if you're interested in that, I invite you to, to have a look at this in this afternoon session. For the gross nervosity star universality class, we in the sa same way also expect that some states will have exactly the same energy in the thermodynamic limit appropriately rescaled but some states are missing. For example, uh, these yellow states, which, which correspond to uh, the fermionic operators, uh, uh, psi, uh, that will be missing on the right-hand side due to a gauge constraint. On the other hand, this fractionized universality class will feature additional topological copies corresponding to the different topological sectors of this spin orbital liquid phases. We expect that uh, basically these predictions should be directly testable in, in, in future numerics, be it either uh, like exact diagonalization calculations of the spin orbital model directly, or be it quantum Monte Carlo simulations of the different topological sectors of the fermionic model. So uh, let me now conclude. Um, I have shown you two examples of flatland quantum phase transitions involving fractionalized states of matter. First one involves a gapless U1 gauge field, and, and this transition can be understood as a confinement transition uh, uh, with characteristic exponents that now significantly differ from the usual gross nervure universality class without gauge field. The second example features a gapped Z2 gauge field, and this can be understood as a spin on metal insulator transition. However, despite that the gauge field is gapped, it still leaves a significant imprints on the universal behavior, in particular the spectrum. These examples uh, were meant to show that critical points involving quantum spin liquids actually offer a whole new playground for, for interesting new types of, of quantum critical physics. In fact, there are many more uh, examples possible and, and, and some of them are actually discussed in the talk by Shoja this afternoon and, and also on the poster by Wilhelm Krüger. And I warmly invite you to have a look at these. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Lucas, uh, for this uh, interesting talk with a break exactly in the middle. Um, so I assume there are a number of questions, please uh, raise your hands or just uh, ask the questions. So uh, uh, yeah, please. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> thanks, Joseph. Thank you, Lucas. Um, you've argued, I, I mean, I think that the origin of your fermion, the, the fact that they're relativistic is, is, is due to the pi flux phase. And in, in, in my world, the, that, that, that means that you're dealing with, with objects called staggered fermions. Um, you've also argued that, 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 that they're relativistic and that you've called them Dirac fermions. Um, I think in general, um, I, I, you know, I'd like to suggest really they're Kähler Dirac fermions, uh, which is kind of geometrically slightly more primitive version of relativistic fermions. And there may be circumstances where Kähler Dirac fermions and Dirac fermions don't give the same answer. Uh, everybody in, in, in the QCD world believes that they do give the same answer, in, in, that's because QCD is dealing with a weak coupling 
fixed point. It's not so obvious to me that in the in the kind of quantum critical points that you've been discussing, that's necessarily a gimme. And in fact, I'm pretty confident that in the case of the Turing model, uh, Kähler Dirac fermions and Dirac fermions give completely different answers. So uh, yeah, th thanks a lot for the comment. Uh, so let let me ask you back what what can you say in a few words what's actually the difference uh between yeah so the assumption, let me call that pi, yeah these fermions or dirac fermions and kela kela dirac okay fermions. Yeah. yeah so it's it's in the you, because these are lattice fermions we're dealing with with a multiple number of species doubled species and um so in, in the world, in the staggered fermion parlance, the, these extra species are called tastes. In the weak coupling limit, the tastes all decouple from each other and, be, and you can think about them as independent species of fermion. But in general, uh, in, from, in the Kähler Dirac approach, tastes are not the same thing as flavors, they're actually tastes. And at, at a, it, it, the most general form of interaction you can write down which is consistent with all the symmetries, sometimes the taste degrees of freedom become entangled with the, with, with the other, the, the internal, the spin degrees of freedom. And uh, so um, that actually leads in, it, that, that means that, that, that away from weak coupling, Kähler Dirac fermions have different global symmetries to Dirac fermions. And I'm just wondering, um, you know, I'm not saying it's. It, I'm not saying it's going to change ever, anything, or, or even that anything that you said is wrong. But I think I think we should at least examine it. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's that's a very good point. Um, yeah. I have no no comments actually on 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 on, <laughs> on more on on that. I mean, okay. <laughs> yeah. It's hard hard to say. I mean, I, I yeah. If maybe oh, I just interject that I'll say a bit more about Kähler Dirac fermions on Friday in my talk because they intervene crucially into some of that discussion uh -huh. too. And certainly the topological properties are very different from Dirac in general. I see, I see. So, yeah, so, so that they actually can would be look very like multiples of Dirac, but not necessarily globally, even at weak coupling. Uh-huh. Okay, okay, yeah. Joseph. Oh yeah, so um, I just wanted to ask, so in your UMT simulations, whether you had looked at the the case with two fermion flavors and whether you could see at the critical point whether there would be a signature of this uh, O3 mm -hmm. to the GN universality class. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. so um, no, we have not really looked into that. And the reason is that uh, it becomes uh, more, more uh, for some reason that I'm not, I'm not sure whether it's really understood why uh, the simulations become more difficult uh, for um, uh, for uh, uh, for smaller numbers of fermion flavors for this particular model, and the reason is somehow that the I mean the heuristic reason is somehow that the critical point somehow shifts to the left, so to smaller values of j, and the the the, the region where we have this deconfined phase somehow is small, and so that's kind of kind of the region where we have. Uh, uh, yeah, well, well, in this small j region, basically we, we have, I mean, since one over j is uh, in front of, so, so in front of the kinetic term of the, of the gauge fields is one over j, this term is somehow large and, and somehow this seems to slow down the simulations. Basically, uh, basically uh, there, there seems to be kind of numerical, numerical difficulties here. So that's why we basically have not looked uh, in, in detail into, into NF equals two. Okay. Or, or actually what we were doing were NF equals eight and larger. I think, well, maybe not all, but most of that. I guess it's also better to compare with the large N in a sense, because- that's, that's another reason. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. It's another talk by, um, uh, sorry, another question by Rajan Mani. So I wanted to follow up on what Simon said um, and maybe there is some way for uh, Lucas to answer this question, not right now, but uh, you know, in, in the future. Uh, when we were looking at um, uh, the difference between say staggered and Wilson fermions, even in QCD, we knew that they were in different universality classes when it came to say the random matrix, uh, because the Hamiltonian um, itself 
either was in the Herbitian or in the symplectic case. And it was never clear why in the continuum magically uh, they would fall, end up in the same um, universality class, even in a weakly coupled theory. So it's quite possible uh, that in the strongly coupled case, like what we are looking at now, maybe they don't end up in the same university class at all. Uh, and this might show up in low lying uh, spectrum, which I think Lucas can look at. Yes, so <laughs> I, I, I agree. <laughs> I agree, I mean, uh... I think I think I mean I, I think it's 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 a very valid point to look at the spectra actually, because that's that has not we have looked a lot at these critical exponents, uh, but uh, looking looking at the spectra I think there's there's lots lo many things that one can do and the, the the crucial point here is that for the spectra it seems that uh, finite size effects seem la much less crucial so. Uh, one seems to get reasonable numbers already from exact diagonalization calculations, which are on, on extremely small lattices, as you can imagine. So I think there is really a, uh, there is some opportunity here to to look at spectra of the of of whatever kind of of um, uh, of universality classes of these these field theories. Yeah. Thanks. And that's a question by Schreitisch. Yeah, I just had a quick comment following up on this discussion about universality and staggered versus uh, Wilson and other things. Um, I think an important thing for the lattice community to remember is that often when we do calculations, we're doing it in a, on a space-time lattice, which has its own extra doubling and other issues. Whereas uh, often the condensed matter physicists look at it from the Hamiltonian perspective, and that has its own uh, bag of worms, but still it's different from the space-time lattice formulations. So at least we have been doing some of this, some of following up on this symmetries and trying to understand how to match the lattice to the continuum. Um, and I think the Hamiltonian seems to give better connection at least to sort of regular Dirac, continuum Dirac fermions than a space-time lattice formulation. But yeah, I think it's, a, it's an important question to follow up. Yeah, thanks for the comment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, and maybe a last question by David. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I was just getting a little bit confused about what this gross nouveau Z2 star universality mm -hmm. class is. So I usually think of the Z2 symmetry as being like a parity symmetry. Yes. A space -time uh, symmetry. So are you, are you gauging a space-time symmetry? No, no. So uh, basically, uh, if I go back here, um, maybe to this slide, um, the point is here that if you look at this model, which I called pi flux model, which is only the pi flux model if these numbers uij uh, satisfy a pi flux configuration. So basically, they have some plus or minus signs on depending on on, on the sites, uh, sorry, on the bonds of the square lattice. Um, that's the gauge symmetry. Um, if uh, if if I fix this. At, uh, at, at this particular configuration, there is no gauge symmetry anymore. So that's a particular sector and it's a gauge fixed sector, if you like. And in this sector, uh, that can be mapped fully to this fermionic model uh, with, with Dirac fermions. However, in general, uh, the model also has sectors where these UIJs uh, have different values than this particular pi flux. Uh, uh, configuration, but you can think of like uh, where where you have well uh, zero flux in, in at some points, or you have zero flux everywhere. Uh, that will not be the ground state, but that uh, that is also a valid valid state in 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 this in this Hilbert space. This uh, this does not map 
to Dirac fermions. This is, I, I don't know. We don't know actually uh, right now what 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 the spectrum of the fermions are. But that's the Z2 gauge symmetry. But that's a different symmetry uh, than the Z2 that is broken. I mean, the Z2 that is broken, that, that that's a global symmetry. But that's I think it's completely independent of this Z2. Does that answer the question? I see. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so then let's conclude the session. Thanks to both speakers of this uh, first session this afternoon.